ready for the word today? All right, let's turn with me, if you would please, to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we will find our opening text this morning. Uh, 2 Corinthians is the Apostle Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. And so we pick up reading here today in verse number 16 of chapter number 4. Paul says this, he says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. How many's noticed that you're not getting any younger? <laughs> oh, are we gonna are we gonna be happy anyway this morning? Can we have church anyhow? <laughs> Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Wow, what an amazing verse. We're going to come back to that here in a moment. While we do not look at the things which are seen, right? Everything we can see today, we don't look to that. But rather we look to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they are what? They're only temporary, including these bodies right here, right? But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Hallelujah. Sister Linda, I'm going to ask that you stand and ask the blessing over the reading of God's word and our time together in his presence. Let's pray along with her. Sister Linda, would you pray for us, please? The Bible says be instant in season and out of season, sister. Thank you, Lord, for this great house of worship. Thank you. I'm most thankful that I spent the last year and a half among people who favor and believe and worship the Lord. Yes. Lord. Amen. The spirit here is contagious and everlasting. Uh, this is the house of the Lord. As the pastor say, let us be glad to be here today to worship. Yes. I am a foot soldier for the Lord any way he can use me. Mm, come on. I'm glad to be along other foot soldiers, and I yes. thank God to be in the house of the Lord today, for there is no other place to be today. Woo! When the church says, amen. Amen. How many love Sister Linda this morning? Give her a big hand. Amen. Once again, Paul says this in verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Have you ever been in a situation where you lost your mojo? Where you lost your spark, the spring in your step? Any humans here today? <laughs> Paul addresses that. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is what? Perishing. How can we be happy? How can we be joyous? Rejoice when our outward man is perishing. Well, this is one way. Yet the inward man is being renewed. What? Being renewed day by day. The title of our message this morning is this. What's happening in me is greater than what's happening to me. Did we get that? What's happening in me is greater than what's happening to the. Say that along with me here this morning. What's happening in me is greater than what's happening to me. You see, what's happening on the inside of us here today and every day that we live is far more important than what's happening to the outside of us. I know we live in a world that spends a lot of time and money on this shell right here. <laughs> now, I, I don't have an issue with putting a coat of paint on the old barn. Is that what they used to say? I don't care with sh about showering. And I, I think we should try to look our best. Come on, somebody. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But we've got to know what's important in life, right? This body is temporary. This body is temporary. 
And then we know what the Bible says. We know that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, on the inside. (laughs) So yeah, what's happening in us is greater than what's happening to us. Paul goes on to say here in verse 17, he says, for our light affliction, our light affliction. Has anybody ever been afflicted before? Right? For our light affliction. I find it ironic that Paul chose this phrase when he said, for our light affliction. Considering the fact that Paul was kidnapped, beaten, threatened, (laughs) arrested many times, even accused in lawsuits, he was interrogated, he was ridiculed, he was ignored, he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by a snake. Come on, somebody. You thought you had a rough week. And eventually he was put to death. All because of his faith in Christ. Wow. Wow. But yet he describes his hardships as a light affliction. Wow. Wow. How is that even possible, Paul? (laughs) Was the pressure getting to Paul? Had he, had he been out in the sun too long? Was he losing his ability to think properly? No, I don't think so. What it was was Paul's outward man was perishing, but his inner man was being renewed day by day. He was growing. He was getting better. Come on, somebody. He was getting stronger. Oh, yeah, on the outside he was getting weaker, but on the inside he was getting stronger. Becoming more and more like Jesus. So Paul chose to describe his hardships as a light affliction. And the way he could do that was he had an internal, or not an internal rather, an eternal mindset. Now, too often today we have a worldly mindset, right? You've heard us say, the world we live in, we get all we can, we can all we get, and then we sit on the can. Leave my can alone. This is my can. I worked for this can. (laughs) But the reason why Paul could describe his hardships as a light affliction is because he had a view of eternity. The reason why he could describe his hardships as a light affliction is he knew that someday he had a heavenly reward that would be afforded to him. How many know the Bible says, lay lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. So Paul had an internal mindset. He knew what awaited him in glory. In in other words, in comparing what Paul was going through here on planet earth, the hardships of this life, all of them, they only paled in comparison what was waiting for him. Oh, Jesus. Have you ever thought what God has prepared for you? For those that love him. Paul explains his reasoning here in Romans chapter 8. He says this. In Romans 8, 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not what? Woo, look at that. The sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Where? Where? In us. (laughs) Wow. 
So with that in mind, I, I think it's safe to say that what, what, what's happening in us is greater than what's happening to us. Wow. Continuing on here in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And again, Paul makes a strange statement here when he says, but for a moment. Everybody say, but for a moment. Paul was around 30 years of age at his conversion on the road to Damascus. How many remember the story? And then he was around 60 years of age at the time of his death. So for more than 30 years, Paul endures many great hardships. He endures many great hardships for the cause of Christ. But yet he says it was for just a moment. <laughs> and again, how could that be, Paul? Paul, we know that you ministered for at least 30 years. We know that you were faithful to the cause of Christ for at least 30 years. What do you mean it was but for a moment? Well, the reason why Paul describes his hardships is once again, he has an eternal mindset. The reason why he describes his hardships as just for a moment is in light or comparison of eternity to come. How many know that life is short, but eternity is forever? How many understand a million years from today we will be alive in one of two places. There was a time when we were not, but now that we are a living soul, there will never be a time when we will cease to exist. Wow. And Paul knew this. He had a revelation of eternity. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. Working for us. How many like it when people work on your behalf? Hello? We all work. We work for our own living, right? The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Somebody needs to tell that generation this. Come on, somebody. This entitled generation. And so we, we know we need to work, but... What is Paul saying here? Something is working for us. Something greater than us. Something bigger than us. In other words, what's happening to us is really working in our favor. <laughs> Remember what Paul said in Romans? We're going to work Paul this morning. Paul's going to get a workout. Remember what Paul said in Romans 8, 28? He says, and we know that some things, most things, oh, come on now. No, all things work together for good to those who love God. How many love the Lord this morning? To those who are called according to his purpose. So in other words, if we love God and as long as we stay in his purpose for our lives, he's going to work all things together for our good. Yes. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him, I got somebody working for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got somebody working for me. In fact, he's working all things together for my good. <laughs> now notice here that Paul didn't say all things are good for us, but yet all things somehow work together for our good. In other words, God uses the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then he takes all that, he works them all together, 
and he works them for our good. It's not just the good things in life that we can benefit from, but even the bad things. How many know we can even uh, acquire some good fr- things from the mistakes that we make? How many's ever had good things come out of your mistakes? Sure. Sure. I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my mistakes. I want to learn from my mistakes. Hello? <laughs> I don't want to repeat uh, the same mistake twice, right? But God uses it all. We, we like to say it like this. In the kingdom of God, there's nothing wasted. Nothing wasted. It's kind of like what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 54. Oftentimes we label things in our life. Oh, this was good. This was bad. This was whatever. But if we're a child of God, God can work all those things together for our good. In fact, I don't know about you, but if I wouldn't have made some of my stupid mistakes in life, I wouldn't be where I am today. Because if I wouldn't have learned from them, I would still be out there doing them today. Somebody help me preach this morning. (laughs) I've learned some stuff from my mistakes. God uses all those things. He uses the good, the bad, and the ugly. But look what Isaiah said in Isaiah 54, 17. The prophet says this. He says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now notice here what Isaiah said. He didn't say that no weapons would be formed against you. That's not what he said. But rather the weapons that are formed against us will not prosper. Did we just get that? (laughs) In other words, the devil is going to take his best shot at you. Hello? I said the devil is going to take his best shot at your home, your marriage, your health, your finances... But Isaiah said, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17, Paul says, for our light affliction. In other words, in comparison to the reward that's coming. Which is but for a moment in light of all eternity, is working for us. Meaning there's purpose in our pain. There's a purpose. (laughs) It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In other words, you think you've been blessed in this life? Honey, you ain't seen nothing until you get to heaven and see the rewards and the things that God has prepared for you there. (laughs) I love the adjectives that Paul used here. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight. In other words, there's some substance to it. There's something there. Weight of glory. Oh, my goodness. Say it with me. What's happening in me is greater than what's happening to me. (laughs) Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day By day, by day, by day. And that inner man or the inner person, the spirit man, the real us, the the Steve that you can't see this morning, that is where our true treasure resides. You see, my treasure doesn't reside with this building right here, this thing that you can see what you would call Steve. This is the temporary Steve right here. 
But the eternal Steve, you can't see. Oh, you can hear him this morning, but you can't see him. And that inner man, that inner person, the spirit man, is where our true treasure lies. Paul said this in verse number 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure. Everybody say this treasure. How many knew that you were a treasure this morning? How many know you're not junk? How many know God doesn't create junk? You're not here by accident. You're not an accident going somewhere to happen. We are all fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and the likeness of God. We are God's hand, uh, his, his, the works of his very hands. We are his masterpiece. Oh, Jesus. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. <laughs> mm. Think about what treasure you have on the inside today. How many understand that the only thing we really own in this life is our never dying eternal soul. You say, well, I own my car. I own my house. Uh, no, not really, because you're not going to take it with you when you die. How many understand the only thing we can take with us when we die is Jesus? Jesus. <laughs> Everything else we have in this life is simply borrowed. It's only temporary. You've heard the story. One day the, the very rich man died. And the, and the question was asked, how much did he leave? Somebody said he left it all. I don't care if you're worth $10 billion. When you die, it stays here. The only thing we take with us is Jesus. And the only thing we get in eternity is what we have already sent before us. How many are investing in eternity today? Are you investing in eternity? You say, well, how do we invest in eternity? By investing in souls like Sister Deb's doing. Investing in the work of God. Investing in people. Yeah, that's how we invest in eternity. As humans, all of our bodies grow old. And if you haven't noticed that, you need to look in the mirror. <laughs> I did this morning and I was scared half to death. <laughs> Can't be me. Trying to wake myself up. It's a bad dream. That's not you, Steve. Uh, it was me looking back at me. But as humans, we, we all get old. We, we eventually, our bodies decay and we go back to the earth in which we were formed. But the inner man, Jesus, the spirit man, the real us, the, the part of us that's going to live for eternity, he's growing and he's becoming stronger every day. Come on, somebody. We're becoming more like Jesus through this process of sanctification. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't give up on me yet. God's not through with me yet. How many know God doesn't throw the clay away? Woo. I, I, I'm so thankful I'm not God because I would have gave up on Steve a long time ago. But I'm thankful he doesn't throw the clay away. And so this inner man, this spirit man is being renewed day by day. And through the process of sanctification, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. Oh, oh, our outward man is perishing. We're getting more weak. We're getting more feeble. We can't do the things we used to do anymore. But spiritually, who Jesus? Mm, spiritually. That's why the Bible says he's called the old because they're wise. And he's called the young because they're Isn't that funny? When we're young, we're not real wise. Or we're strong. And then by the time we get a little wisdom, we're weak and feeble. 
if we could somehow get them together, huh, Pastor Tom? Well, that's why we got to join arms over the generation. How many know there should be no generation gap in the church? He's called the old because they're wise. He's called the young because they're strong. Hello, come on, somebody. And what we got to do is older folks, as senior saints, we got we to raise up and train a generation that's coming up behind us. Wow, that's our purpose. That's our function. Not just to, to win souls, but to raise up leaders. To raise up the next generation. <laughs> I, I think if we really understood this, it would change our outlook on life. What's happening in me is greater than what's happening to me. And you see, this isn't just a New Testament revelation, but even David understood this way back in the Old Testament. Let's look at it here real quick in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 18. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to David, and he would not heed our voice, and how can we tell him now that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, Yes, he is dead. So what did David do? Did he go off? Did he go in a rage? Did he harm somebody? Did he harm himself? No, absolutely not. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he what? Worshipped. Ooh, Jesus, he worshipped. Mm. How many know death took his baby, but death couldn't take his worship? Mm. Lord, have mercy. I feel like preaching this morning. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. And there he went to his own house. And, and when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, what is this that you have done? We don't get this, David. Why are you acting this way? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. But David says, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No, but I shall go to him. <laughs> but he shall not return to me. Wow. Wow. So first of all, David realizes that death was final. He wasn't going to bring the baby back. But yet he had a life to live. He still had responsibilities. He had a family to take care of. In fact, he had a kingdom to take care of. Come on, somebody. So David realizes that death was final. He, then he realizes that life was short. Life is short, but eternity is forever. But he also realizes that his actions or his behavior have consequences. Ah. Hmm. The wages of sin is death. David just experienced that. And so now David realizes that he has sinned a great sin. And, and, and we know the story. We know Bathsheba. But it didn't just stop there with Bathsheba. We know that when he called for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to be killed in battle, David greatly sinned. And because of that, the entire kingdom, not just David, but the entire kingdom, in fact, his entire family, would suffer now. Mm. But yet, in the midst of all this, the good, the bad, and the ugly, how many know the struggle is real sometimes? How many humans do we have here this morning? But yet in the midst of all this, something was happening on the inside of David. How many know God uses broken people? <laughs> and you see, what was happening in David was greater than what was happening to David. Even
even if, watch this now, even if some of David's pain was self-inflicted. Hello? (laughs) Because you see, when Isaiah said that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, how many understand that that includes us? Hello? Because how many know that sometimes we are our own worst enemy? How many know we're like Barney Five shooting ourselves in the foot sometimes? Why'd I do that? Huh. But yet the word of God says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, including me. You say, well, well Steve, how can, how can you say that? Listen, God knew what we were made of. He knew the mistakes you were going to make in life. But yet he loved you anyhow. He called you anyhow. He placed you into his kingdom for such a time as this. Oh, no, I'm not condoning sin. But what I am saying, we serve an all-serving, all-knowing, all-seeing God whose grace is more than enough. Look at your neighbor and tell him his grace is sufficient. (laughs) Wow. Wow. (laughs) Sometime the weapon that formed against us is us. But it's not going to prosper. My flesh will not prosper against me. Hello? That's some, that's some good revelation for somebody here today. And it's good news. How many like good news? David goes on to say this in Psalms. Look at this. Psalms 34. Verse 19, he says, Many. Everybody say many. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of how many? All. 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 Wow. He guards all his bones, that not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. How many know him today as deliverer? God ever delivered you out of some stuff? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You've come too late to tell me he doesn't deliver. But you see, as children of God, we must remember... That when everything around us is being shaken, we live, we reside in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Oh yeah, judgment begins at the house of God. And judgment isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means that God really loves us. And he doesn't want us to be lost, so he judges us. It's the wrath of God that we need to worry about. And so when everything uh, is being shaken around us, we need to remind ourselves that we we are in and of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. How many know we live in this world, but we're not of this world? Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. We're just pilgrims and strangers for a time being here in this land. But we're on our way home. How many is looking for a city whose builder and maker is God? Look what Jesus says here in John chapter 16. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have. (laughs) Everybody say, you will have. In other words, it's coming. You're going to experience it. You're going to go through it. You will have tribulation, but be of what? 
<laughs> How's that possible? Kind of sound like Paul talking here, doesn't it? You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus encourages us here to be of good cheer because of the fact that he himself, watch this now, he himself has overcome the world. You say, well, Steve, what what does that mean to us here today 2,000 years later? Well, remember that verse? He is Christ in us. The hope of glory. The Christ that conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. The Christ that got up on the third day from the grave. Come on, somebody. That, that Christ, that Jesus, that's the one I'm talking about. That Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in You and I, and if it dwells in us, it shall quicken our mortal bodies. Somebody shout, it's the same Holy Ghost. So if if God, wrapped in human flesh, if Jesus could overcome the world, then guess what? That means we can. Through his victorious life, we can become overcomers just like he was. In fact, real quick, let's look at it in Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And it says, And so the great great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a, a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser, everybody say the accuser. The accuser of our brethren who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. How many know you never want to be an accuser? No, because accusers will be cast down. Verse 11, and they overcame him, the devil. And they overcame him. Not talking about Jesus here, but we're talking about overcomers. And they overcame him by how? The blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And watch this. And they did not love their lives to the death. (laughs) They did not love their lives to the death. How many know you can't kill a dead man? I'm already dead. You can't kill me. How many understand in this year of 2023, we don't need to get better, we just need to get deader? Hello? What did Paul say? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless. Look at your neighbor and tell him, we need to die in 2023. We need to just get out of the way. Let go and let God. (laughs) Pastor Tom, that reminds me of that message, dead men feel no pain. It's hard to get offended when you're dead. You can't offend me when I'm dead. Come on, somebody. Because dead men feel no pain. Well, that's a whole other message. We ain't even got time to go there. (laughs) <laughs> but we're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Somebody shout, I'm an overcomer. <laughs> oh, no, shout it like you mean it. I'm an overcomer. <laughs> I'm an overcomer. Yeah, yeah. We said it Wednesday night. I refuse to be the victim. Mm-mm. I refuse to be a victim when God created me to be the victor. Jesus died that I might be the victor. Why am I going to let his death be in vain and take on this victim mentality that the devil wants to put on me? I refuse to be a victim of my circumstances. I refuse to be a victim of what they said or did to me. 
You, you just missed a good place to shout right there. Come on now. I refuse to be a victim of my own weakness. I refuse to be a victim of the mistakes of my past. That was the old me. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I don't live there anymore. Remember Wednesday night? Jesus told the man, take up your bed and walk, son. You don't live in this place of despair anymore. Get out of here. <laughs> Woo! I refuse to be a victim when God created me to be a victor. Look what Paul said here in Romans chapter 8. We're going to bring this to a close. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, all these things, we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. Oh, I don't know about you. I would just settle for being a conqueror, but con Paul says we're more than conquerors <laughs> through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you everything that the devil is doing to you right now is just so you'll go back on God. Just so you'll denounce God. That's what he wants. That he, he, he wants you to go. He wants you to become discouraged, disillusioned, disappointed. Right? Right? And he'll try 101 things to make that happen. Why? Because he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> but how many know the devil's already been defeated? The devil's a liar. Hello? And Paul says, we are more than conquerors. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm more than a conqueror. That's all right. We don't go by feelings. We walk by faith and not by sight. Sight is a feeling. It's, a, it's one of our uh, senses. So even when I don't feel like a conqueror, that's all right because I'm more than a conqueror. Amen. Because it's through Christ who loved me. Mm. How many understand the more hell comes against you, the more we become like Jesus? <laughs> How many remember the Old Testament story, King Nebuchadnezzar. He threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. The furnace was cranked up hotter than it had ever been before. In fact, the, the guys that threw them in died because of the heat. That's a hot furnace. <laughs> but how many understand that God just didn't deliver them from the fire? But how many know he got inside the fire with them? When they should have been dead, old King Nebuchadnezzar comes somewhat close to the, the furnace. He couldn't get real close because it was so hot. He goes, wait a minute. How many guys did we throw in there? I thought it was three. I see four. And the fourth man looks like the son of God. I just got one question. How does an Old Testament evil king know what the Son of God looks like? How many know when you see Jesus, when you have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, honey, you're going to know who he is. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. So God just didn't deliver them from the fire. He got in the fire with them. Can I tell somebody today, the hell you're going through right now, God is right there with you going through. And you know what he's saying? Just trust me. Keep a hold of my hand. Come on. We're going somewhere. Trust me. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. 
Nothing that you're going through has taken him by surprise. In fact, you were made for this. Oh, I know sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes I don't feel like it. But God has given you the grace to go through what you're going through. You say, well, you got Bible for that? Yeah, remember when he, when he set out Job? Basically, in our lingo today, we would say, well, God threw Job under the bus. Have you considered my servant Job? Gee, thanks, God. <laughs> How many know God has more faith in us sometimes than we have faith in ourselves? <laughs> God just didn't deliver them from the fire. He got in the fire with them. How many starting to get the picture here today? You see, life happens. Pain happens. Frustration, disappointment happens. Failures happen. Mistakes happen. But in the midst of it, God is with us. God is for us. <laughs> he said he would never leave us nor forsake us. Woo, Jesus. My Lord, have mercy. Mm. You see, oftentimes as Christians, we want God to deliver us out of our trouble. When all along, God is trying to bring us through the trouble. Oh, there's some things you need to learn. You, you need to learn some patience. You need to learn to trust me. But not only that, how many know when we go through the fire, some things have come off of us that we never needed in the first place. If we go back to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they bound them. In other words, they tied them up and they threw them into the furnace. Well, guess what? The only thing that was burnt off of them were the ropes that bound them. Can I tell you the only thing that you're going to lose in this season is the stuff you never needed to begin with. Mm. Somebody shout, there's purpose in my pain. So King Nebuchadnezzar had them tied up and bound. And the only thing that burned off of them were the ropes. And not only was Jesus on the inside with them, but when they stepped out, guess what? Guess what? Smell me. No, yeah. I don't smell smoke. I don't smell smoke. I took a shower this morning. <laughs> Trying to make this old body look good, so I took a shower this morning. When they come out of that fire, they didn't even smell like smoke, honey. The only thing they lost in that fire was the ropes that bound them. Can I tell somebody in this season of hell that you're going through right now, honey, the only thing you're going to lose is the thing that's trying to kill you. You see, some of you have lost some friendships. Some of you have lost some haters. But I'm here to tell you, you never needed them in the first place, honey. <laughs> you see, God knows what we need and he knows what we don't need. Huh. Wow. If we can just somehow get this. There's purpose in our pain. There's purpose in the fire. Oh, I know we want to be delivered out of it, but if we'll just trust God, if we'll just, if we'll just keep a hold of his hand, he'll lead us through it. My last scripture, praise team, you can come. We started out in Paul. Now let's go back to Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This time verse 8. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Wow. Struck down, but not destroyed. <laughs> Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. 
But the only way Jesus can live in Steve is if Steve dies. All the time as Pentecostal, spirit-filled, charismatic people were, were saying, Oh, more Lord. Fill me up, Jesus. Overflowing, right? We're always saying that. But how many, how many understand God can't fill a full vessel? And how many know many in the church today are full of themselves? We ain't got time to go there. But many today are full of themselves. But how many know we got to empty ourselves out? Ooh, Jesus. And, and see, that's what those hardships are all about. It's getting the flesh out of the way. It's getting the P word, pride, out of the way. All that stuff we thought we needed we never really needed to begin with. Because all we truly need is Him. Him. The three Hebrew children found out that day that all they really needed was Jesus. But you know what? I, I love what they said before they got thrown in the furnace. And this, is, and this is why I believe God delivered them. He said, oh, king, you know, that's fine. You've made this resolution. you made this decree. But you know what? If God delivers us, fine. If he doesn't, we're still not bound. In other words, the way they become an overcomer was they loved not their life until the death. The reason why, my, I feel like starting this message all over again. The reason why we don't have very many overcomers in the church anymore is we love this too much. Oh, it's all about me, Pastor Steve. Don't you know that? Don't you know this is the 21st century? I like it my way and I can have it my way. If not, I'll go to another church. Well, guess what? There's the door, honey. Because at Full Gospel, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. But it's all about Jesus. <laughs> this is where we die. This is where we die. <laughs> this is where we die. I was we were praying a couple a couple years ago. We were praying here on a Tuesday morning, and I was in the back, and I was looking up here, and I was just praying. We'll we'll move around and do different things on Tuesday morning, and I was looking up here towards the altar, and I said, God, why don't we see the fire on the altar anymore? He said, where there's no sacrifice on the altar. And I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. Who, who's the sacrifice? And he said, you are. Whoa. Whoa. Well, guess who's taken me off the altar? I have. The way we become a house of prayer, and, and, and Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer of all nations. The way we become a house of prayer is by crawling up on the altar and offering our body as a living sacrifice. This is a place of death. This is where we die, right here. My Lord, have mercy, Jesus. <laughs> Let me say this and then we'll close. This is closing number three. I know this is my last one. Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. Here we go. We just celebrated Christmas, right? We just celebrated Christmas a few weeks ago. With that in mind, let's break this down here real quick. In the manger, he became God with us. Right? Remember the name Emmanuel means God with us? In the manger, he became God with us. But at the cross, he became God for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? So in the manger, he became God with us. At the cross, he became God for us. But guess what? In the upper room, 
<laughs> I said in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, he became God in us. He is Christ in me, the hope of glory. And that's what makes me more than a conqueror. That, that's what makes me more than an overcomer. Stand with me, if you would, please. I'm trying to get somebody to understand today what's happening on the inside of you is greater than what's happening to you. Listen, everybody and their brother might be against you, but if God be for you, some of you, 2022 was. A horrible year. But guess what? You lived to tell about it. And not only did you live to tell about it, but look, you're here today in the house of God. Can I say it like this? The devil, the devil should have killed you while he had a chance. Because now you're going to make him pay for it. How many want double for your trouble? Somebody say, I've come for my stuff. You see, what should have destroyed you, God's going to use it to promote you with it. Oh, not because you've been perfect, because you've been faithful. Because he said, if we're faithful to the end, we'll receive the crown of life. Nowhere in there did he say, be perfect. No, the only perfect one was Jesus 2,000 years ago. I'm talking to somebody here today who needed to hear this word, and I don't know who the Holy Spirit is speaking to, but he's speaking to somebody. And somebody needs to know what's happening on the inside of you is greater than what's happening to you. Can we come and just worship the Lord? You can pray, you can stand, you can worship, you can kneel. We've got plenty of room up here, but let's just close out the service around the altar here. Come on.